Hi, this is meteorologist Steve Pelletieri, and I am the weatherman. Welcome to our latest podcast, and this time, I'm going to be talking about a topic that's near and dear to my heart. Well, at least I like the topic, but it's actually a very difficult subject. The topic has become very easy over the past 10 to 20 years, well, at least easy to predict, but easier to understand and easier to forecast somewhat because of our improved weather forecast and model technology. What are you talking about, Steve? I'm talking about aviation weather. Actually, when I started out in 1974, 75, and 76, my weather office was in a trailer at Marstown Municipal Airport in Marstown, New Jersey, with a gentleman named Howard Haviland. One of my podcasts deals with that whole story. But being at Marstown Airport, of course, and being in the 70s, aviation weather was a mystery subject and a tough matter to deal with. At Marstown Airport in the mid-70s, there was a company called Warner Lambert. It since has been absorbed by Pfizer, which also has been uh, working with other companies as well in these days of COVID. Uh, and there was also a company called Allied Chemical. That was also absorbed by other companies. American Can, AT&T, and a lot of smaller aviation weather companies. So having my office at Marstown Airport pretty much put me in line with doing aviation weather reporting, and forecasting. Now, one of my very first good clients and some very good friends, too, that I met was from a company called Union Camp Corporation. They made the paper bags that uh, we have at the supermarkets before all the plastic came in. Well, Union Camp was eventually absorbed by international paper, but they had uh, several aircraft and many flying crews that we used to talk to each and every morning. And we're talking very early in the morning, 4.35, 5.36 a.m. You got to get there in order to put the packets together, the weather aviation briefing together ahead of time. So uh, although we weren't 24-7 at that time, uh, it's pretty much you had to get there very, very early. So we would get their scheduled trips from the office at Morristown Airport. And this company had three what's called Lockheed Jet Stars. That was a corporate aircraft with actually four engines. It was a small aircraft, but it had two engines in the back near the tail on each side. Pretty much like a DC-9 or 727, but there were four engines in total. So it was a very powerful aircraft. Had extra fuel tanks on each wing. And uh, they were very loud, but they were also very efficient. Even the President of the United States had a Jetstar for shorter routes. and was called uh, Air Force One from time to time. And actually did um, actually uh, land at Marstown Airport as well. I think with uh, President Reagan back in the 80s. So we also did weather forecasting for at t Group, which is located at the field. They had several very large aircraft called Gulfstreams and Falcon 20s and Falcon 50s and various other craft, aircraft to shuttle the many executives that were at at t at the time. Now remember, this is before the Judge Brown broke up at t into Verizon and all the other different companies and all the other things that happened. But they used to fly in and out of Marstown Airport on a regular basis because their headquarters was down in Bedminster. and needed a lot of weather information, which was up to us to provide. My problem with aviation weather is that you never know what would happen to the schedule. It was a different every day. Like considering that we're uh, nowhere you're flying every day, some days when the weather was very bad, everybody would call. And uh, when you had very lousy weather, um, it was always very tough and you had to really be on top of the weather situation. So you get there early, put together the weather briefing package and give it to the flight crews. But when the weather was nice and clear, even though they had a flight, it was easy to do and not that many calls came in. So this is, you know, different from airlines because airlines, they have a schedule. They go to the same place practically every day on a regular basis, regular flight numbers, always know what's going to happen. But with corporate aviation it was always going to be different and they flew to different places like maybe as close by as dc or as far as ireland or europe and for that matter even asia and all at different times and this is back in the 70s when the, the weather situation where at least weather forecasting wasn't that easy now when the weather was bad as i mentioned they all used to call and when the weather was good they couldn't care less, and they needed in route weather and weather at the destination. So the, there was a package that you had to put together, but it was a little bit easier. Those were the easy days. 
That's the interesting thing about aviation weather. You have to know or at least forecast what's going to happen at the departure time at the specific airport, in other words, where you're coming from, let's say Marstown Airport, and what the weather is going to be aloft between where they leave from and where they're going. And that means you have to know what type of climbing out conditions you're going to have, what type of temperatures aloft for fuel burns and uh, information like that and all that information was readily available what the weather is en route at altitude and along with the winds aloft the winds aloft are very important because it would tell them pretty much uh, how quick or how slow it would they would be getting there and how much of a fuel burn that they'd have how much fuel they'd have to have on board so we'd also have to note uh, where there would be turbulence aloft as well and surface weather conditions at the destinations and alternates were very important to know as well. So we had to know that. So in other words, you're, you're saying, what's going to be at Morristown? What's going to be a loft? And what is it going to be at the destination? And is there an alternate, especially when the weather was very bad? We're dealing with a multi-dimensional sphere of forecasting in aviation weather. In other words, any flight that occurs has another departure weather, the climate conditions, and they're all important because they rocket up there pretty fast, but the winds at altitude can change. And again, like I mentioned, could cost uh, a lot of money as far as extra fuel burn. Carrying fuel makes you, uh, when you carry extra fuel, that actually makes you use more fuel because it's a heavier aircraft. So uh, we're, we're dealing with mostly uh, weather situations for these corporate aircraft back then at higher altitudes between 30 and 40,000 feet. And at those places, the weather is usually pretty good, except for the tops of heavy thunderstorms. And of course, turbulence, though. These pilots were dealing with, you know, CEOs and some higher ups in all these companies. So they had to make sure that their flight was nice and smooth. You know, they didn't want to get anything on their suit when they had to go to that meeting. They usually leave for the meeting in the morning and get back at night. It was pretty easy. Use the corporate aircraft, even if it's going out to Chicago or down to Atlanta or something like that. It uh, was really important to. Uh, find safe altitudes, smooth altitudes, and also efficient altitudes for these corporate X, uh, corporate aircraft that uh, we used to deal with. So we had our corporate clientele, and we dealt with also uh, giving them information anytime and anywhere that they wanted it for. And we had the private pilot too. Now, private pilots are different because for them, it's either just a hobby or maybe just going back and forth between their beach home and their business home where they make money so uh, that's one of the considerations also and those folks actually had a little bit of a schedule so I had a uh, one client his name was Joe S and he loved Martha's Vineyard and that's where he had his sort of like other home his weekend home he wanted to work in Jersey and then go all the way out to Martha's Vineyard on the weekends sometimes taking four-day weekends to enjoy it and so he had his aircraft and he would fly it out there by himself or with his wife and just uh, stay out there uh, other folks that we knew loved nantucket both places martha's vineyard and nantucket are very tough to forecast for so joe s was in his 70s at the time and he wanted to know details always and that was a tough thing to do not only that but these pilots in the smaller aircraft they flew an extremely lower end of the atmosphere Joe didn't have a pressurized aircraft, so he can go and couldn't go above 12,000 feet. And a lot of times, very bad weather and a lot of icing also occurs somewhere between, say, the surface and as much as 12,000 feet. So it's a much more difficult type of aviation weather forecasting. Pilots that flew in smaller aircraft flew an extremely lower part of the atmosphere, and that made it more difficult. So at the time I was working between the corporate pilot who flew high and fast and the private pilot who flew low and in a very active portion of the atmosphere that we had to do the forecasting for here en route and at the destination. That's extremely difficult. And it was extremely stressful as well. They really make big demands as far as uh, learning from your mistakes, anticipating problems that you may not know much about. So you had to do a lot of research. And this was back in the 70s. In the day, the main computer guidance models were horrible absolutely horrible so that's what what we were working with in the 70s and 80s but today however it's a different thing our models are much better and we'll get to that in a moment or two we are getting into the second decade of the 21st century weather models for aviation are much better aviation weather reporting is accurate it's timely and it's intense and there are many tools for both the private pilot and the corporate pilot as well 
in addition to the airline industry and the military to get in the weather that they need for a safe and productive flight. With that in mind, I'd like to talk about today what tools are available for the private, corporate, and commercial airline and military aviation weather departments. Well, we'll start the discussion in the way that we always start all weather discussions, and that is with the National Weather Service. The National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, first and foremost, we go back to the Internet, and that's where we have tons of aviation weather information available now that we never used to have in the past. The primary site is the Aviation Weather Center of the National Weather Service, and you can find that at aviationweather.gov, aviationweather.gov, and no, no separation between the aviation and the weather. This is A-V-I-A-T-I-O-N-W-E-A-T-H-E-R.gov. And that's a storehouse of information. This site has an impressive amount of information for the private and commercial pilots as well, and anyone else interested in aviation weather. First thing that you see when you go to the site is the current surface weather chart. Now, there's uh, several layers into this weather site. And that first one is a chart called surface chart, weather surface chart. Uh, weather depiction charts are also in there, but we'll get to that in just a moment. But surface charts basically tell you temperatures, high, mostly uh, temperatures, the dew points, wind direction and speeds, cloud cover, and also altimeter settings. But when you deal with what's called a surface uh, depiction, weather depiction chart, that's where for each city, for each major city that's reported, you get ceilings and visibilities and total cloud cover and any other type of weather that's occurring there. And then we talk about weather, what we mean is uh, talking about uh, precipitation in the form of rain, sleet, snow, drizzle, fog, haze, dust, all that, all listed on the weather depiction. So it's basically the surface weather chart for the aviation interest. Now, below that first chart that you're going to see there, below that picture of the chart, is another map called the Regional Metar Plot. Now, this is pretty much more of a true what we call weather depiction. Clicking the aviation identifiers in each will bring up the weather conditions in that region. So you have the Mid-Atlantic, the Northeast, New England, Southeast, so on and so forth. You can also type in on the right side your request for what's called a METAR data. A METAR is basically what's called a Meteorological Aerodrome Report. It's French. It was adopted, it was basically back in the 1990s. We all wanted to go on a standard, and of course the French have to get their two cents in there, and that's what we uh, are now in. Now, on the other end, as far as forecasting is concerned, it's a TAF, which is a product that we use to get forecast for an airport. It stands for Terminal Aerodrome. There's that word, aerodrome again, forecast sort of like a European flavor to an airport. The METAR and its corresponding TAF began use in the United States on July 1st, 1996. And it was adopted because it was an international standard code for weather standards around the globe. So in other words, if you're going to get a METAR for uh, Russia or for China or for India, or for Africa, all going to be in the same type of form, the same structure of information that used to come from it. So that started on July 1st, 1996, and it was adopted, as mentioned, because the international standard for weather uh, standards all around the globe made it just more efficient. And they're all listed in a time called Greenwich Mean Time. That's called GMT. In this way, by adopting the standard of observations and forecast and the time, we, were, we all were on the same page as far as what the weather is in a specific place and what time we're talking about. What we call it, uh, Greenwich Mean Time uh, of 20 hours is called 20Z. So 20Z in the United States is the same time as 20Z in South Africa. It's the same time as 20Z in Malaysia or in Australia or in Beijing. So it's all the same. 20Z is 20Z. And that's why having a standard time, observation, and forecast just made it a lot more easier across the globe to have safe and efficient weather information. Now, I personally believe that the, the standard observation form that the U.S. had before 1996 was far more informative and far more accurate as far as the observations and also the forecast were concerned. It was a little clearer, and the forecast uh, used to be called terminal forecast, and uh, they 
pretty much covered a 24 hour period, but it was just a little bit more detailed, I thought. And it was much easier. But then again, that's what I grew up learning, uh, the uh, terminal forecast and the uh, actual weather observations in the U.S. form. But uh, again, they are all gone. So that's that. Now we're using TAFs, METARs, and uh, all other standards all across the world. Now, a lot of the weather observations that you can see on METARs uh, are going to be taken either in three forms by actual meteorologists, by FAA personnel, or by some type of automatic weather observing system. And the automatic ones are just not as good as what the FAA or actually what, what a meteorologist would report at any specific place. And, and that's because meteorologists tend to give you more detail that has to do with weather. The FAA is dealing with the aircraft themselves. They are trained to be giving you uh, specific information as far as ceilings and visibilities are concerned, and winds, of course, and turbulence. But uh, again, uh, they're very busy because not only are you doing weather observations, but they're also talking as controllers to all the various Air Force aircraft that they are in, uh, in contact with at that time. So METAR is taken either by uh, meteorologist, FAA, or automatic. TAF forecasts, on the other hand, are not made for every airport. And the TAF forecasts come from the um, forecast office, the weather forecast office, and they are literally hundreds in the United States and, of course, around the world. Uh, and they all make TAF forecasts for their major airports. In France, they'll do it for uh, Charles de Gaulle Airport and for, for Heathrow in, in Britain. It would be the British Weather Service and, of course, for Frankfurt, uh, the German Weather Service there. And that's just as an example. Same thing in India, same thing in China, and also North and South American countries in IPA and Canada as well. So they all make those TAF forecasts at uh, forecast uh, operations places like in the United States, they're called uh, National Weather Service Forecast Office. They make public forecasts, which are plain language. It's going to be a sunny day. It's going to be a rainy day, blah, blah, blah. But as far as aviation is concerned, they have to give the details of the ceilings will be this at this time. The visibility will be this up until this time and then change because of rain showers, so on and so forth. So uh, detailed aviation weather forecasts are a lot more complicated than just plain language forecasts, but they're all made at forecast offices. And the National Weather Service calls those uh, National Weather Service forecast offices. And the closest ones to us here in uh, Mount Holly and also in up to New York and also up around uh, in the Boston area and D.C. area as well. Now, those TAF forecasts are only made for the larger airports, and they're not made for every airport. So TAF forecasts are usually made for places where a lot of commercial airliners and major aviation interests exist. So in other words, in the Northeast, if you were flying from Andover, New Jersey, to Central Jersey Airport in Middlesex County, you would have an observation from Andover, which is automatic. They get an automatic uh, weather observing station there. And uh, when you go down to central Jersey, there is no weather information. You'd probably have to call the fixed base operator and ask them uh, what the conditions are, and they'd probably try to give you a good idea, but it's nothing that's actually published. Now, if you were flying from Morristown, New Jersey, to call weather observations or METARs taken for both airports, but there are no TAF forecasts for both of those places. And finally, if you're going from LaGuardia down to Reagan International in D.C., there are excellent METARs and excellent TAF forecasts in both places. So the hierarchy of airports and the amount of iron that goes in and out of those places determines whether or not they're going to have a TAF forecast. Not all airports are served the same. It depends on how much aviation action occurs in each place, as mentioned. And this is true all across North America. Flying from Chicago to Denver, great weather info. On the other hand, if you're flying from Wings Air Airport in Philly to a grass field in West Virginia, you have weather info at Wings, but very little in West Virginia. So it gets difficult, and that's why aviation is a top subject on the private pilot's written exam. And we're going to talk about that private pilot's written exam aviation-wise in future podcasts here. But suffice to say, we have METARs, which tell us aviation-wise what the weather is at each city, and we have TAF forecast, which is expected at each city on a constant basis, 24-7, 365. Now, getting back to our website, aviationweather.gov from the National Weather Service, there are tons of other weather information available at that site, and they include advisories for pilots. 
and that includes sigmits, which are significant meteorological events in an area across a given flight path. And they have forecasts for both convection, and that's like thunderstorms and turbulence, which has a lot to do with temperature profiles of loss, and frontal systems working in and out of an area. Aviation weather forecasts not only deal with what the weather is, but what the weather is going to be at both the origin, en route, and at the destination. En route, weather deals with forecasts and observations of icing, which is extremely dangerous, especially in the lower end of the atmosphere. Winds and temperatures off prognosis charts uh, of what the weather is going to be chart-wise. Aviation weather forecasts are also given for places where uh, they do not have to have forecasts. It's called area weather forecast. So that covers, a, so for West Virginia, that one place that we were going down to, a grass field there, you'd have to look at the area weather forecast. But it's not specifically knowing the elevation and the exposure of that field that you're going to. So it's just a basic uh, averaging of what the forecast is going to be for any specific place. Those places do not have METARs or TAF forecasts. It could be tough flying in and out of there. Other things that are covered in aviation weather gov, weather.gov include the important observations. We're talking about METARs, but there's also aviation or pilot reports. Pilots often refer information back to radar and weather centers about what they're experiencing. For example, if it's clear, they'll go on and tell you that. If it's turbulent, they'll break the turbulence identification as to light, moderate, or severe. And of course, we've all had some of those rocky flights flying around the country from place to place. And uh, it could be uh, quite upsetting when you have some of that severe turbulence. So uh, our pilots, our uh, flight departments try to avoid that at all costs for our passengers. Now that very information is very important, but as I mentioned, it's, it's not just one altitude, it's multidimensional. So I have a private pilot dealing with the lower atmosphere. He has his turbulence, it's, uh, let's say somewhere between 3,000 and 10,000 feet. Then a commercial pilot flying at 20 to 40,000 feet also is providing important information. Other observations that are very important for aviation include radar, which is invaluable, especially when dealing with heavy precipitation areas and convective issues, like thunderstorms and tornadoes. And finally, satellite images, which can tell you pretty much if cloud cover is low, medium, high, or non-existent. Aviationweather.gov also has some important user tools that are available. Uh, there's a flight path tool which tries to highlight the weather from your origin to your destination, a text data server, which will give you information uh, of when you uh, reply, they request the information, they'll give you an actual reply to that request. It's sort of like a uh, more personal back and forth between the briefer and sometimes a computer and the pilot. And that helps with decision report, decision support, I should say, meaning should you go or not? Should you go north or south or maybe not at all? That's decision support. That's also listed in aviationweather.gov. It's also a user tool you can get in order to obtain a standard briefing, which is, in my opinion, pretty neat because you can say I'm going from Harrisburg and I'm going to Cincinnati. And I'm going at 8,000 feet and leaving at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. I expect to arrive in Cincinnati at 4.30 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. And with that information, you can automatically get a standard weather briefing. But that is, again, on aviationweather.gov. So there's a lot of great information on that site. It's not true that the airline industry uses the National Weather Service exclusively. The airline industry, of course, starts with the National Weather Service. As I mentioned, all weather information comes from the 9,000-plus meteorologists, technicians, FAA observers, and volunteers who make up the National Weather Service and FAA. But airlines, the major airlines, have their own departments, their departments are pretty much like what I did on a really, really small basis back in Morristown in the 1970s and 1980s. For example, the Delta Airlines Meteorology Team is located in Atlanta. And they have been experimenting with new models and changing the way they disseminate key forecasts and weather sites to the uh, Delta Airlines operations. Of course, Delta goes all around the, air, the world. They initiate a new interactive forecasting system to help track advanced weather data. And they do this in one centralized location in Atlanta. That weather information goes out to all Delta operations across the world. The Delta team continually monitors weather around the globe, particularly where the airline and its partners operate. Obviously, 
They need to do that because of connections. They have a ton of heavy focus on their hubs because if a flight can't get into a hub, you can't get them out. Connections are missed, and it could be really tough and really uh, very costly for the airline. Reworking people, rescheduling people, putting them on other flights, even sometimes other airlines. So that's Delta. United has their team in Chicago, so they do similar work in their hubs, their various hubs. And, of course, the one locally here in the Northeast is at North Liberty International, especially after the merger of United with Continental. On the other hand, Alaska Airlines has their Aviation Weather Center on the West Coast, knowing that just a few years ago, most of the airlines got their weather reports through the teletype or the telex on a pilot used to have to look through reams and reams of paper. Uh, and that's basically what we did back in Morristown in the early 70s. Nowadays, however, everything is digital. Pilots download detailed flight plans and weather reports and are full of intricate graphs and tablet devices. The flight dispatchers who work alongside both pilots, uh, schedulers, and aviation meteorology people track aircraft in real time and uh, right up to the minute weather data. Now we're also dealing with a new generation of aircraft radar systems that uh, allow for easy flight adjustments. Okay, that's going to be it for this week. It's really a lot to, to talk about, a lot to digest. Next week, uh, we're going to have part two of this. Uh, we're also going to talk about the summer so far and what it's like to be summer at the North Pole or a above the North, the Arctic Circle. Some pretty interesting tidbits about the 24-hour sun and basically how that will be changing quickly only through the normal march of time as we get over the next month or two. But my producer says I am constantly going too long. So until next time when we start talking about part two of aviation weather and the summertime and take a little look at what's happening up in the arctic circle i am meteorologist steve pelletieri and i am the weatherman thanks for listening talk to you next time